I had originally intended this video as an exploration of the possible dangers surrounding a task as great as translating the teachings of Lao Tzu. However, upon my inspection, this specific translation turned out to be worse than I had anticipated, and not only in language, but also in philosophy. Within the first paragraph of his introduction to the Tao Te Ching, the renowned Sinologist D.C. Lao warned that the Lao Tzu is, without a doubt, by far the most frequently translated work in Chinese. But unfortunately, it cannot be said that it has been best served by its numerous translators, as the nature of the work attracted many whose enthusiasm for Eastern mysticism far outstripped their acquaintance with Chinese thought or even Chinese language. And 25 years later, in 1988, without knowing a single word of classical Chinese, Stephen Mitchell translated and published his own version of the Tao Te Ching. Over the years, Mitchell's Tao Te Ching has grown in popularity, reaching over a million copies sold, and now remains as a bestseller. This popularity, coupled with one whose enthusiasm far outstripped their acquaintance with Chinese thought and language, has brought me to conclude that Mitchell's Tao Te Ching, a new English version, is the worst translation of the classic to date. But before I make my case, I'd like to express appreciation for this text in two ways. The first is that this text has undoubtedly led to the introduction of a vast number of people into the study of Taoism. It was the first version I had access to, although at the time I gave the text little thought. Despite the means it has done so by, the expansion of interest in Taoism is commendable. The second is that, as a standalone text, it does not inaccurately portray the modern Western philosophical understanding of Taoism. And, had it been named the Tao of Mitchell, and simply said to have been inspired by, or a commentary to, the words of Lao Tzu, I would have taken little issue with it, and would have felt no need to make the video you are watching now. But it wasn't. Instead, it was published as a translation of the Tao Te Ching, and now competes with numerous other translations, and trumps them in popularity. All the while, failing to do the one thing expected of an English version of the Tao Te Ching, portray the words of Lao Tzu. Before I can show that Mitchell's version is the worst translation, I must establish what a translation is and the standards by which anyone can measure one. Undoubtedly, nearly all would agree that the central task of translation is to express the words or text of one language in another language. In Mitchell's own words, translation is the art of stepping out of the way. When one picks up a translation, their interest is in the words of the original author or authors, in this case, the words attributed to Lao Tzu. Hence, the measure of a translation is its success in expressing the words of one language into that of another, in this case, from classical Chinese to modern English. There may be difficulties in doing so, as with rhymes and parallelisms, but the central task does not change. Mitchell's translation fails its task in three ways, through intentionally mistranslating, omitting entire sections, and crafting his own sentences. Mitchell's minor mistranslations may be the most harmless, since they tend to be his swapping of two characters or ignoring the meanings of individual characters while maintaining the form of most translations. Nonetheless, they misconstrue the words of the original text. One example of this can be seen in the first chapter, where Mitchell sticks to the normal translation for the first four lines, but then seemingly deviates from the original text, where the original classical Chinese may be understood as Lao puts it, the nameless was the beginning of heaven and earth, the named was the mother of the myriad creatures, Mitchell instead translates it as, the unnameable is the eternally real, naming is the origin of all particular things. Not only does he leave out the parallel between the named and nameless, and instead opts for a noun and a verb, he inserts the eternally real when there's no basis for it, and swaps the ending word of the second line, mother, out for the ending word of the first line, origin. As a result, his translation of these two lines does not well reflect that of the original text. The second failure of Mitchell's translation may be the most egregious. On numerous occasions, Mitchell omits entire lines worth of text from his own translation. These are surprisingly easy to come by if one compares Mitchell's version to nearly any other. While most occurrences of this exclude between two to four lines, more severe examples can be found, such as in the 39th chapter, where Mitchell omits about half of the entire chapter. Not much can be said on that which is not, as I couldn't find a particular trend for Mitchell's omissions. I would guess that roughly 5% of the original text was ignored entirely, while many other sections went untranslated, 
yet could be found as inspiration for Mitchell's additions. At some points, when Mitchell omits sections, he will leave them gone, but it's more common than it's said he will craft his own sentence with some to no inspiration from the original. Oftentimes, this is simply the insertion of his own commentary into the place where the original text should be. At other points, it's pulled out of thin air. The 46th chapter exhibits these differences. D.C. Lau's translation says, When the way prevails in the empire, fleet-footed horses are relegated to plowing the fields. When the way does not prevail in the empire, war horses breed on the border. There is no crime greater than having too many desires. There is no disaster greater than not being content. There is no misfortune greater than being covetous. Hence, in being content, one will always have enough. Mitchell's, on the other hand, says, When a country is in harmony with the Tao, the factories make trucks and tractors. When a country goes counter to the Tao, warheads are stockpiled outside the cities. There is no greater illusion than fear, no greater wrong than preparing to defend yourself, no greater misfortune than having an enemy. Whoever can see through all fear will always be safe. Needless to say, Lao's translation is reflective of the original Chinese text. Lao Tzu did not refer to factories and warheads. However, Mitchell's modernizations of the original words are less concerning than his manipulation of the rest of the chapter. While maintaining the same format, Mitchell alters the words and thereby their meaning entirely. To say that there is no greater illusion than fear is undoubtedly vastly different from saying that there is no crime greater than having too many desires. And Mitchell alters a poetic and meaningful ending to the chapter that suggests that, in being content, one will always have enough. To Whoever can see through all fear will always be safe. This is seemingly to maintain a theme of war and fear throughout the chapter, when the original text has no such consistency. There are a countless number of examples. Almost every chapter either had unnecessary lines or words added or removed. The only chapter I believe to be a faithful translation was the 40th, which only has four lines. Of course, with so much misconduct, Mitchell was fully aware of his inaccurate translations, and in fact, intended for the book to be this way. To quote Stephen Mitchell, Sometimes, when the original text seemed weak or conventional, written from what seemed to me a denser level of consciousness, I tossed it out the window and improvised. I wrote as Lao Tzu. He says in an interview, And finally, once again, I have often been fairly literal, but I have also paraphrased, expanded, contracted, interpreted, worked with the text, played with it, until it became embodied in a language that felt genuine to me. Thus far, I have spoken about Mitchell's Tao Te Ching as a translation. However, there does exist the defense that the book is not a translation, and makes no claim to be one. Mitchell makes this defense in his Q&A section where, in response to the concern, but you're not really translating here, he says, Correct. That's why I call the book a version of the Tao Te Ching, not a translation. I gave myself the freedom to take off in any direction when that felt appropriate. Frankly, I wouldn't mind dismissing this text as not a translation, since it clearly doesn't meet the standards which should qualify something as a translation. However, whether or not Mitchell and I take this book to be a translation does not change the fact that the overwhelming majority of people who purchase and read this book believe it to be a translation and there's ample reason as to why. First of all, it shares the name of the original. Tao Te Ching is the romanization for the book of writing that has been attributed to Lao Tzu, and naming any book this shares the implication of being a translation. Open up the book to its foreword, and Mitchell confirms that what follows will be the original Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, only translated into English. If one looks at how it is sold, Mitchell is listed as the translator, and Lao Tzu as the original author. If one is to look to the back of the book, three of the four quotes refer to it as a translation, or Mitchell as a translator, and Mitchell himself cannot even be consistent in refraining from referring to it as a translation, as in the Publisher Weekly, where he clearly refers to it as one of his translations. Not to mention that Mitchell's defense of this text as a version instead of a translation is nonsense. Now, I must warn you that I am no linguist but one of the definitions of version is literally translation, and when it is marketed and spoken of as a translation, the understanding of version that will come to people's mind is nothing other 
than to mean that it is a translation. And if one has not yet found enough reason for this text to be commonly considered as a translation, they need look no further than the copyright page, where we can clearly see that it is in fact catalogued by the Library of Congress as translation of Tao Te Ching and the original author Lao Tzu. Thus, we have a book that was written without the interest of translation and that does not meet any reasonable standards to be a translation, yet is listed and marketed as a translation. This is the definition of deception. It is a misrepresentation of the teachings that have been passed down from ancient times. If Mitchell had been honest, the text would have been labeled something like the Tao of Mitchell, but it clearly shares the name and claims the original authorship of the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. Therefore, the defense of the text as anything other than a translation falls on its face as it becomes clear that this text is intended to be thought of as a translation, all the while failing to be one. Mitchell's version failed its task of translating the words of the classic, but what about the thought? While Mitchell at times simplifies the cryptic language of the classic, his additions are often also nearly as enigmatic as the original. With minimal commentary and analysis, Mitchell's version doesn't offer much of a philosophical framework for the text. However, if there is one clear failure of Mitchell's conceptions, it is in his approach to the text. Over the span of his four-page foreword, Mitchell introduces the Tao Te Ching as a cohesive text written by the historical Lao Tzu about the Tao and the practice of Wu Wei, and suggests that his own translation is more accurate to the thought of the historical Lao Tzu than others. This is an outdated, reductionist view of the text. The existence of the historical Lao Tzu is anything but certain, and the general consensus among scholars today is that the text was not written by any one singular person, but a multitude of others around the time of the 4th century BCE. The reference to Lao Tzu as the author by those outside of the Taoist tradition is done so for lack of a more accurate answer. By ignoring that the text is likely an anthology formed over many years, Mitchell ignores the shifts of focus, influence of various different schools, and possible contradictions throughout the text. Without these, the text risks being reduced to its basics in the Tao and Wu Wei. Instead, the best approach to a text such as the Tao Te Ching is rather like that of D.C. Lao, who writes, Since we cannot expect a high degree of cohesion in the thought, the most sensible way of giving an account of it is to deal with the various key concepts and to relate them wherever possible, but also to point out inconsistencies when these are obstinately irreconcilable. The reader of Mitchell's version is by no means equipped to do so. We've already seen this in the examination of the 46th chapter, wherein Mitchell chose to rewrite the text rather than maintain the change in focus that was present in the original. Luckily, it is clear that Mitchell has formed his own understanding of the text through acceptable English translations and commentaries. As a result, in the little that he writes specifically of the philosophical concepts of the Tao Te Ching, he doesn't make any glaring errors. However, for the newcomer, forming their understanding of the wisdom of the Lao Tzu from Mitchell's text alone, what certainty is there of accuracy in their philosophical conceptions? In a text as important and profound as the Tao Te Ching, wherein every word can be said to have significance, Mitchell's mistranslations can cause serious misunderstandings. Surprisingly, for someone who has spent so much time working with texts that are religious in nature, Mitchell goes out of his way to turn the Lao Tzu into an overtly anti-religious text. In the 72nd chapter, he includes a clear criticism of religion that doesn't have a basis within the original text. With respect to Taoist religion specifically, Mitchell suggests that the true disciples of Lao Tzu are to be found in the Zen tradition, thereby alienating the countless practicing Taoists who have revered Lao Tzu since ancient times. This has become a popular view of modern enthusiasts of Taoism, the gatekeeping of Lao Tzu from the Taoists of the Han to the modern day. More on this can be seen in my video, Taoism Divided and Reunited. And Mitchell's commitment to preach in Taoist thought can also be brought into question by his second book of the Tao, a book that rightly includes excerpts from the Zhuangzi, but concerningly, the other half of it consists of excerpts from the Doctrine of the Mean, one of the four Confucian classics alongside the Analects, Great Learning, and Mencius. As far as I am aware, the doctrine of the mean has never been considered to be within the Taoist tradition, and has no place in a work titled 
the second book of Tao. So if Mitchell's version is the worst translation, then which is the best? This is a hard question to answer. With the sheer number of translations there are, there's bound to be an excess of good translations. My recommendations would be either Addison Lombardo's or DC Lau's for the scholarly classic. If you want a version that tried, like Mitchell's, to be poetic and minimalist, yet actually succeeded, check out Addis and Lombardo's. If you have a favorite translation that I haven't mentioned yet, or know of any other concerning translations, let me and everyone else know in the comments and why. On a side note, Ursula Le Guin used the same process as Stephen Mitchell by using Paul Karras' version with the Chinese text and translation without having any prior knowledge of classical Chinese. Now, I cannot speak for the accuracy of the text since I don't have it on hand, but sharing the same process as Mitchell's is enough for me to question its legitimacy. I hope this video wasn't too negative. There isn't too much that really grinds my gears, but one thing that does is academic dishonesty, especially for profit. But that's all I've got to talk about today. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe. If not, let me know why. As always, please let me know if you think I got anything wrong. And until next time.